It's a pleasure to be here tonight, and it's certainly good to see everyone that is here back again for another evening of worship to our Lord and Savior. You might have guessed by the songs that John led for us, and I appreciate them, that uh, tonight's lesson is going to have something to do with God's law. And actually, the title of my lesson tonight would be The Problem of Discernment. And if you will turn with me to Hebrews, Hebrews the fifth chapter. Verse 14. God has said, but strong meat belongs to them that are full of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And if we're talking about discernment, discernment in its simplest definition, I guess, would be the act of understanding or recognizing something. And to go a little further, it means to see and to identify by noting differences. In other words, I must distinguish good from evil, right from wrong, and truth from error. Now normally, we don't have much of a problem choosing between what is pleasant or unpleasant. But when it comes to deciding between good and bad, we often have a problem with that. What is pleasant, in fact, may be bad. And what may be unpleasant may even be good. So the problem is not one of choosing that which necessarily pleases me, but of choosing that which is best for others and myself. For example, our church and the gospel. Discerning and doing what is best should please me, though there are times when I even wonder why it's necessary to be tried by fire. By reason of use, as we read in Hebrews 5 and 14, means by reason of practice or habit. Long practice with the right standards enables the Christian to affect the right discernment. The Christian's mental faculties exercise at first on the simple truths become a practice or habit which increases their power later to apprehend the higher and more secret or the hidden unknown ones. And we can see from the writer of Hebrews where the Hebrew Christians had failed to bring out their faculties which increased with practice. They were open to criticism of still being spiritual infants in need of milk rather than strong meat. For the good of my soul, I need to develop the habit of weighing matters. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Much trouble can be prevented by farsighted discernment. So I propose a question to you. If you obey the laws of the land and always discern to live your life within those laws, is that enough? We should talk about that. Over in Job 32 and verse 9, we see where great men have blundered because of faulty discernment. Some men and women have been great in spite of their mistakes, but to the extent they faltered in discernment, they decreased their greatness. So let's talk a little bit about good and evil itself. A lot of people are against any attempt to classify good and evil as is taught in Hebrews 5 and 14. To them, nearly all moral practices are good and almost all religious teachings are right. To them, the right or wrong of an act or teaching is not 
in the deed or precept, but it's rather in the mind of the participant or the instructor. And so what may be right for one may be wrong for another and vice versa. According to some of these same people, every person is a God unto themselves. Now, if that were true, no man could ever choose evil provided he thought he was choosing good. And no way which seems right could ever be wrong. So let us look over at Proverbs 14. I'd like to read verse 12 over in Proverbs 14. It's right here in my Bible somewhere. It's always hard to find when you need to. <coughs> Proverbs 14 and 12, what does it tell us? It says, There is a way which seems seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now if I jump over to Job, or Proverbs 16 chapter and read verse 25, what does it say? Again, it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some ways are good and some are bad. We need to know that the bad way has its penalty in spite of how inviting it may look to us. If we were to switch or modify the signs on a road, that will not make it a good road, or it won't make it a bad road, but it will bring woe or harm to the people that drive on it or follow those signs. So in Isaiah 5 and 20, we read where God says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So the right or wrong of a thing is not just a matter of personal thinking. Since truth and right are facts rather than abstractions, then I must change my mind to fit truth and right rather than changing them to fit my mind. Perhaps the greatest sin of the age is mankind's futile attempt to change the right to fit himself rather than to change himself to fit right. Amen. The Bible freely speaks of good and evil. And I think we all know that. There are so many verses and there are so many uh, texts that we can read in regards to this. And I have listed here several examples of good and evil. And I'm going to look at the first couple of them with you and turn to verses. And those that I mention later on, I'm going to give you the verses that you may want to check into later on. Now, if we're talking about good and evil, then obviously there are good men and there are evil men. If we look at a good man, I can turn to Psalms 37 and 23 and give you an example. That's Psalms 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Now the evil man, let's turn to Psalms 140 and verse 1. That's Psalms 140, verse 1. We read, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. Now, as I was saying, I have several examples here. Good works are evil works. Good works we can find in Matthew 5 and 16. Evil works 
you can turn to James 3 and 16. The good path, Proverbs 2 and 9. Evil course, Jeremiah 23 and 10. Good advice, again, Proverbs 20 and 18. Evil counsel, Isaiah 7 and 5. Good name, Proverbs 22 and 1. An evil name, Deuteronomy 22 and 19. Good fruit, Matthew 7 and 17. Evil fruit, Matthew 7 and 18. And I could go on and on with these. As I say, most of you are familiar with these terms and you have read these verses before. I'm sure that many of you have. But let me give you now some biblical examples of failures in discernment. In 1 Kings, the 13th chapter, now we studied this here not too long ago, but remember the young prophet that was deceived by a lie? He was one of the finest specimens of humanity. He's even called a man of God. He had courage and he even cried out against King Jeroboam's idolatry at Bethel, not fearing for his own life. But God had commanded him to neither eat nor drink nor return by the same way, as you see there in verse 9. Now he obeyed to a point, and this young prophet could not be taken in by flattery. He even refused an invitation to be the guest of the king. Obedience to God meant more to him than royal honors. However, an old prophet turned his mind. And how did this happen? The old prophet followed after him and told the young prophet that an angel had said, Oh, bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water, as you see there in verse 18. The old prophet lied to him, and it cost the young prophet his life. His downfall is wrapped up in one statement. He failed in discernment. He believed a lie. And in verse 19, we see where he went back. If we choose to serve God, we must obey His commandments. And let me add that we should add nothing to His commandments or take nothing away from His commandments. Turn with me to Galatians, the first chapter. Beginning in verse 6. Paul is telling the Galatians here, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? So do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Let's look at another example over in Luke, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 16. We're going to talk about this rich man. Now again, I'm going to be paraphrasing most of this. In this passage, we find that this rich man was smart enough to make money, but not smart enough to discern material and spiritual values. He enjoyed such a bountiful harvest that his barns were running over, 
prompting him to say he would build bigger barns and fill them and then say, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God called him a fool because of discernment. Number one, he left God out of his life. And two, he thought his soul could live on things stored in a barn. Now let's turn back to Matthew, 22nd chapter, beginning in verse 15. You can see here where the Pharisees were trying to trick or to trap Jesus. They couldn't comprehend two loyalties, earthly and heavenly. They thought that Jesus couldn't either. So away they go to him with their entangling question. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? And Jesus answered them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Well, he confused them. Let's turn to the book of Luke 10th chapter beginning in verse 38 let's talk about Martha and Mary now Martha had to choose between two important things to prepare a meal or to listen to Jesus now Martha chose the less important activity but her sister Mary sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Then Jesus kindly talked to them about which one had the finer perception and the greater power of discernment. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now let's turn to the book of John. Chapter 8, beginning verse 3. Again, we're going to read about the scribes and Pharisees here. Here we can see where the scribes and Pharisees that were seeking to stone a woman brought her to Jesus. Now, here are self-righteous, ever-ready condemners of other accusing this woman of adultery. And they are strutting in their piety, claiming to be sticklers for the law of Moses. They remind Jesus that the law of Moses demand that she should be stoned and pressed him for the verdict in this case. All the time trying to find some wrong with Jesus. But Jesus answered them, He that is without sin among you cast the first stone. It was then that they all suddenly had something else to do. They made mistakes in this manner and they erred in their discernment. Number one, they didn't bring the man with them. Number two, they made a spectacle by setting her in the midst of the crowd. And three, they didn't even care who they hurt just so they could make their point. And number four, they beheld the sin in another's life, failing to see any in their own. And also they point to sin in another in an effort to feel bigger, cleaner, and to whitewash themselves. Now Jesus understood this matter properly by showing less concern for the woman's past than for her future. And he said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And again, there are so many examples that we could cover, but no matter what decision we make at any time about anything regarding God's law, remember that God's law is right. It's always right. It has been right from the creation of man and way before that. There is no excuse, nothing we can say or do 
that will override God's law, but it is so common for mankind to try to find a way to get by God's law, especially when it has to do with something that pleases us or makes us feel good. It's just often so difficult not to do those things, but God tells us what He expects of us, and He doesn't mince His words. Anyone can read the Bible, and if they really, really care about doing right, they're going to find that there's no other way to be right. How many times have any of us, or all of us, shunned God's Word to do something that made us feel better? We all have to answer for that, and we all will. Again, like I said, there are numerous places in the Bible where we can find many examples of proper and improper discernment. But now we need to consider the discernment we make towards serving and obeying God. And it's easy enough for us to know this if we follow the Scriptures. Scriptures that we are all familiar with are in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Mark 16, 15, and 16, and Acts 2, 38. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, in verses 19 and 20, we see where Jesus tells his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then again, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Jesus says to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And Peter said to them in Acts 2.38, he said to this large crowd of people at the day of Pentecost, after they realized that they had put Jesus Christ, the living Son of God, to death on the cross. And they were pricked in their hearts. So Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, let us all consider who we are most of us here have already accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. I don't know, there may be one or two in here that have not. But there is no other way to the gates of heaven if we don't go through Jesus Christ. There's no way that we can have a relationship with God the Father without the love and support of Jesus Christ. Anyway, if there's anyone here tonight that is subject to God's invitation in any way, whether it be accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior or whether it be bringing forth your sin and letting people know that you have done wrong in the sight of God and you wish to improve, let us know as we stand and sing.